Thank you everyone for joining us for our graduate school applications panel. This is a continuation of our graduate school panel series from over the summer. Uh, and in this panel, we have professors from a number of aerospace programs across the United States to get their perspective on um, applications and sort of the reviewer slash selection side of graduate applications. So we have uh, Dr. Anna Diaz from Texas A&M, Dr. Christine Hartzell from University of Maryland College of Park, Dr. Dr. Rebecca Masterson from MIT, and Dr. Elaine Petro from Cornell. And I'm Matthew Marcus. I am the Technical Development Chair for WOA, and I will be moderating tonight's panel. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation. And I, I'm really, really excited to be, to be here in this panel. Uh, so my name is Ana Diaz Artiles. I am from Spain. So I have two last names. Um, and I am an assistant professor at Texas A&M University. So I've been there just a couple of years, um, now in the middle of my third year, I guess. So pretty, pretty new and also figuring things out, um, you know, how this job works and, and going through applications for the first time, um, you know, this past couple of years. So I haven't been doing this for a long time, but I, I'll share my experiences so far. Uh, to quickly summarize my background, um, I am a traditional aerospace engineer from Spain. And actually I went to industry for five years. So maybe this is something a little bit different from other panelists here. And I wasn't even thinking about a PhD. Uh, and maybe it's because of, you know, at the time I in Spain, we, we don't have um, the same culture and then almost nobody do PhDs. Um, so, so I never thought about it at the time. Um, I went five years to industry. I worked in Ariane Space, which is the European company that launches the European rockets. So I was working in operations, like really, you know, you have the spectrum between research and operations. So totally the other side of the spectrum. Um, uh, so, so I worked there for five years and after you know, some time there, definitely something was missing. And um, also I, I was always, always have, has been really excited about the human component, the human side of things, astronauts, um, and all that made me going back to grad school and get my PhD on, on something more related to bioastronautics and human performance. Um, so, so I, you know, I was an international student uh, with, with no connection in the US, I guess, and, and just trying to work my way out into US applications. Oh my gosh, I need to do a GRE. What is this? Um, the TOEFL, you know, this, this kind of exams and, and things. So, so for those international students, I'm happy to, to talk more about this. Um, and yeah, I was lucky enough to get into MIT, into the aerospace engineering department, but um, focusing more on the human side of things, which is what I do now. And, and why my lab in uh, Texas A&M, the name of the lab is Bioastronautics and Human Performance. So a little bit of physiology as well, engineering, uh, bioastronautics, I guess it's this weird word that no one knows what that means. Uh, so just blending um, traditional engineering with more human side of things, biology, physiology, um, human experiments, and, and these kind of things. So I'm going to stop here and, and then happy to keep, keep chatting. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Hartzell. Hello, I'm Christine Hartzell. I'm an associate professor at the University of Maryland. Um, I've been at you know, University of Maryland for six years now. And um, my research area, I primarily study dust or very small grains. Um, I like dust specifically on the surface of asteroids. Uh, this is Bennu behind me. And um, I, so in addition to studying dust, I study grains that are driven by other non-gravitational forces. So, um, I'm interested in dust plasma interactions and um, very, very small orbital debris, which I, I think of as dust. Um, so some things dust related like that in space. 
Um, my path from undergrad to my current location is I did my undergrad at Georgia Tech and then I went to grad school at University of Colorado. And then I did a postdoc at Caltech for about a year and a half. And then I became a professor at UMD. So pretty much a straight line all in aerospace engineering, except my postdoc was technically in a mechanical and civil engineering department. Um, but my research is very interdisciplinary between you know, traditional aerospace engineering and planet planetary science topics. Thank you, uh, Dr. Masterson. Hi. Um, it's Becky Masterson. I um, am a researcher at uh, in uh, the Air Astro Department. And um, let's see, I left my I guess parents' house in 1993, went to MIT, and here I am. Just so, it was so great. I will say I tried I tried desperately to leave multiple times, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So I did my undergrad, you know, there. I was actually in the, uh, I was actually in Mecky. I, I I came out of high school at a time when my science teacher said, "There's no jobs in aerospace. You should go into mechanical engineering." <laughs> so I did, and uh, but all the time I, I I kind of wanted to be over. I was always looking over at the aerospace department, and I actually interned uh, you know for aerospace companies. And so when it came time for um for the masters, I did look look at the other schools, but I, I ended up staying. And I, I stayed in the mechanical engineering department, but I worked for someone that was over, um, uh, that was actually with aerospace. And that was the beginning of sort of straddling these two, um, uh, this both, both of, uh, um, this was departments. Um, and then after I finished up, up the master's degree, the company that I had interned with, that, that no longer exists because they were eaten by, by uh, this big aerospace, they actually paid for, for my master's degree. So I had to go work there for like a year. And that was my year that industry to see, do I really want to get this PhD or not? I, I wasn't 100% to know certain. So I went to work for a year and it was great fun, but then I decided I did want to come back. So I went back, I stayed you know, over at Mechanical, but I did all of my research uh, and worked in the aerospace department. When I was done, I went you know, over to, to work um, for Draper, which which admittedly isn't super far from MIT, but it is not at MIT, and uh, worked for Draper for six years. I did all uh, uh, the team that I worked on that did the flight control for shuttle when we were basically building the ISS. So it was pretty fun. I did a, like, all of my uh, I guess graduate work was in structures and um, the interaction between um, just the control system and like large structures in space. Uh, I actually worked on something that used to be called uh, I guess NGS. T, which is now the James Webb Space Telescope, but I was working on it 30 years ago, <laughs> and maybe it'll launch. Um, so, so, you know, I, I went to Draper, uh, I worked there for six years, and then they stopped flying the shuttle, and I went back to, you know, my advisor to have lunch one day, and he said, well, why don't you come back and postdoc for a year, and I was like, I'm a little old for that, but I did anyway to see what the lab was doing. Um, and then during that time, time we actually uh, we, you know, won a student instrument that was going um, to visit uh, actually the asteroid that Christine has up there. And uh, I knew nothing about asteroids at the time, but I, I started leading the student instrument um, and I just fell you know, in love with instrument design. And so 10 years later, here I am still at the Institute uh, and running my own, um, now I actually run the lab with it that I started in and I have my own um, this group within that. And we do basically uh, you know, science instruments, but from the engineering perspective. So a lot of systems type of work, still looking at controls uh, and dynamics, but at a bit of you know, a higher level. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Petro. Thanks. Oh, it's a lot to follow. Um, I'll, I guess I'll say I, we said from undergrad to grad school, right, basically. So I, I did undergrad in aerospace engineering and I wasn't ready to apply to grad school right at the end. I was like, honestly, like a little burnt out of undergrad, like our aerospace course, especially junior and senior year is tough. And I was work, I had an internship with NASA and I was interested in trying that full time. So I worked at NASA Goddard for three years 
and I worked on James Webb Space Telescope, which as Peggy mentioned, uh, used to be called NGST and still hasn't launched, which is crazy, but it will be amazing when it does. And of course we have to get it right because it's like a $10 billion program by now or something like that. Um, and then I also worked on the MAVEN mission, which we talked about before while I was there. And right as the MAVEN mission was going to go to Kennedy and I would have gotten to like live there with it for a little while and work the launch campaign, I decided to go back to grad school. So that was like a tough decision to make, but I had the opportunity to go back at that point, three years after undergrad before I had completely forgotten everything. And uh, I went back to Maryland and did my grad school in electric propulsion in one of the labs there. And then I did a postdoc at MIT and I was always interested, but scared of faculty jobs. Uh, but I ended up with ones and this is my first semester. So, so far it's um, fun and yeah, happy to be here on this panel today to talk to people who are, um, you know, looking forward to similar paths perhaps. Thank you. So we received a number of questions um, from everyone from uh, your SVPs before the panel. So we're gonna try to get through as many of those as possible. But also, if you think of any questions during the panel, feel free to enter those in the chat and we'll try to get to some of those as well. So we'll uh, start going through some of the questions now. Uh, so one big question that we got from a lot of people to, uh, to kick things off is uh, just generally, how does the selection process work at your school? You know, every school does their school selections for grad school a little bit differently. So, to your knowledge, how does the overall selection process work? And then um, what sort of input do you have as an advisor to the selection process? Are you, are you sort of involved from the beginning? Is there you know, rounds uh, before it gets to you? How, how does your role as an advisor play into that? Should we start again the rounds? Um, we can, or if anyone just like wants to jump in, that's fine too. <laughs> okay, so I, I guess I, I can start. Um, so I can talk to you about how things work at TAMU in my department. And I know um, this is gonna be different at MIT, at, at Cornell, because I've, I've been involved in those two institutions, but I led uh, Rebecca and Elaine to talk about their processes. At TAMU, uh, it's actually very, very um, non-structured, uh, let's just put it this way. So we faculty have the freedom to hire anyone as long as they have um, the appropriate GPA. There, there are a couple of things that you need to get, uh, which is the, your GPA higher than, for a PhD, I think it's higher than 3.5. Um, and then for a master's, it's a little bit lower than that. Um, but I've also seen, you know, people with 3.45, um, you can just, you know, ask the, the graduate committee and typically they, I've never said, uh, seen them say no to something like that. So it's really, really very unstructured. Um, however, you need to have like the, the bad part of it is that even if you're like a really, really top student and you're better than everyone else in the pool, uh, if no one picks you, no one picks you, you're not gonna make it. And I know that's different maybe at MIT where they have a list somehow and maybe things have changed. Um, and then if you're at the top of the top, you're gonna make it and then we'll get you an advisor somehow. Um, here, it's, it's more really, the, it comes from the advisor, it's the driven force, and as long as an advisor wants you, um, I just have to say, hey, I want to I wanna hire this person, uh, prepare a letter, and as long as you, know, you have the appropriate GPA and all that, that, that works. Also, we have deadlines, but we can hire anyone at any time. Um, as well. So if you miss the application process, you know, some universities like ours, um, you know, maybe I just get a new grant in March and I couldn't get anyone before because we have to take decisions basically now in, in January, February to, to be competitive against other schools. 
Uh, if you don't have your offer out the door in, in January, you lose all the students. But if you don't have funding, and it's always the difficult part for us. Uh, but then there is like a grant coming on March and I need someone to start in the fall. I can, you know, I can pick whoever I want and, and I don't have to do anything besides just, you know, get your application in the system just to, to do the due diligence. But, but we have the freedom to hire people at any time as well. So, so I guess that's a little bit of piece of advice. If, if you guys find yourselves in that situation, some schools, you know, I guess more, more than just us run the whole thing in, in this way. And sometimes, you know, this can happen very often. You faculty just get grants that, that just come in a different time of the application process and, and people are looking for students at any time of the year. So that would be a, a small piece of advice. I can speak to it a little bit from MIT. Um, so I don't sit on the graduate committee, so I can only really speak to, to my experience as, um, uh, as the advisors uh, that come in. But what I can say is that all of the applications are looked at by a number of different uh, potential um, basic faculty member um, so advisors. So every application will be looked at by three or so, and they'll all give their, their impressions of the, of the application. So um, who looks at your application? Well, oftentimes, I think that everybody on the graduate committee looks at actually all of them, so they have a lot, a lot of work to do. I tend to get given, you know, a certain amount based on if I've been mentioned in the, you know, either me or my lab has been mentioned in the statement of objectives or if the, if the interests just line up well with mine, right? So I'll get a, a smaller batch to look at. Um, and there is a, there is, I feel like we, we, we meet as a, there are a couple of, uh, it, it used to be, it, it used to be that the systems, you know, folks like all met together, but they have reorganized the sectors. And now I think there's a, there's a whole space sector. So it's changed a bit, um, but the whole space, you know, sector will meet and discuss the and discuss, you know, basically all of us. So although it's similar to what, uh, to what Anna said in that, you can you can sort of pit, you know if someone stands out for you you can advocate for that student the decisions are are made at at the sector uh, at the sector uh, at the sector level so you're like balancing um the you know the class as a whole and there's a, like a goal like number um that we're looking to reach as well so it's it's a similar process and that certainly the advisors do have a lot of say and and matching with somebody is an important um um that's a part of it um but there is um, some discussion among everybody if, to, to sort of, of balance the class that's coming in. So Maryland is more like TAMU. So we have advisors have a lot of, of say in who gets admitted. And, um, you know, just like Anna was saying, if the downside of that is that if even if you're a great student, if there's not a specific advisor that wants to work with you and says, I will pay for this student, um, then you're not going to be admitted. So really, our admission doesn't is not, you know, solely a reflection on your qualification. So you shouldn't take it personally if you're not admitted. It just might mean that someone doesn't have funding for you right now. Um, but yes, so basically, you know, we go through, you know, I go through a li the list of applicants in the space systems area and the flight dynamics and controls area and look at candidates, see if they're, if they mention my lab um, and, or if they seem to have interests that are relevant to mine. And then, you know, those are the students that I'm going to pursue um, and interview and, um, things like that to decide who I really want to fund in the in the following year. I'll just add one more thing about funding because that was something that was mentioned here is that um, a student for, to be admitted uh, in, in the aerospace department, you need to have an advisor who is willing uh, that wants to work with you, but you may you may or may not get a funding offer to go with that. So you do we do make offers that say, You've been admitted, so and so is going to be uh, you, uh, you, uh, you, your advisor. You don't have to stick with that particular advisor. So that person, if that person is committing 
to you as a student, but you are not committed to them. So you can come in and if there is no you know, funding attached to that offer, you may go work for somebody else. But like admission is not necessarily like, it, you can get admitted without a funding offer, which is a good and a bad, it, it, it's a good thing because it gives you a chance to, to get admitted and look around and find something, but it, it can also be difficult if, you know, if there isn't funding that comes along you know, later. But sometimes like Anna mentioned as well, you might not have a grant at the time that you make the offer, but then it comes in like later. And, and I've had that happen where I've admitted a student without funding, but then by the time that they're making the decision, I'm able to find funding for that. So that can happen too. Right, so, so just to um, finish that also, at, at TAMU we need, we, we have the freedom to make it the offer at any time to any student, but we commit to fund you for two years if it's a master's, four years if it's a PhD. So you definitely need to have the funding to do it. Um, which again, it's good and bad depending on what you're looking for. but. I, I think it's important to be aware of these things, um, how each university works and, you know, to pursue, to, again, as Rebecca was saying, don't take personally and sometimes it's just a matter of bad timing and, and you apply to grad school when you apply to grad school and, and that's part of the game. Um, so, so yeah, I have a, I, I'll tell you something later when we talk about funding. I'm sure we all have funding stories <laughs> having gone through grad school. Um, but we all, we all made it, so that's the, what matters. Um, I'll just add for Cornell, it is interesting to see how it's, it varies a little bit look, uh, place to place. So at Cornell, from what I've seen just one year so far in participating, is kind of like MIT, and uh, applications are broken into sector. And then you, you may sit uh, on the committee of a certain sector. And so there may be however many faculty fall into that categories. We'll review all of the applications for that field. And then you may or may not end up in more than one pile, I think, because you have the option to list like first and second choices. And then from there, uh, the way that Cornell works that's different is they do direct to PhD admissions, which is kind of quite different than other programs that I've been a part of, and they guarantee you five years of funding as the department, um, but you, and you also come in and you are not um, tied to any particular professor, although you're admitted by like a field and you may be like, it's certain professors that are kind of vouching for your application, but you have the freedom, you come in your first semester and you do kind of this rotation uh, program or, or just kind of informal rotations and then you match with an advisor by the end of your first semester which you may or may not have known going in that that would be your advisor so that's what I know about it so far thanks everyone so I think that covered the general uh, admissions process and it sounds like kind of the recurring theme is that, that there's various processes where um, you know the university basically filters down to you know some small number of candidates that are referred to you as uh, you know potential grad students in your lab. So once you receive those uh, candidate graduate students, what do you look for um, in potential grad students or members of your lab? Uh, do you look for previous research experience? Is it is it mostly GPA based? Um, you know, do you like to see people that have uh, some experience in industry? What do you look for when you're reviewing an application? Um, oh, Christine, do you want to go first? We, we have more experience that. than me. <laughs> um, okay, we'll, we'll alternate. So, um, so I look for students that have had prior research experience or prior internships. Um, or working in industry, I mean, basically something other than just classes. Um, so research or doing internships is really important because you know, you're know you basically showing that you know how to work on a project independently and can formulate interesting questions and solve those questions outside of the context of just you know a homework set. Um, and I also look for students that have you know, shown a passion for space, right? Like, I feel like people that choose the space field versus other fields are people that kind of have this idealistic passion for space. And so 
I definitely want to see that in applications. Um, so that might be, you know, through extracurriculars or through the internships that they've done or the research that they've done. Usually there's some space, you know, relationship there. Um, and then I like to see people that have done something outside of classes. So again, you know, extracurricular activities. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, secretary or treasurer for AAA, right? It could be some other organization entirely on your campus. But again, I want to see people that are well-rounded that do things besides just classes. Um, because classes don't really translate that well in, into research, right? It's more doing a PhD is more than just classes. So I try to look for, for these other things. Yeah, I would say that the, the, the order of things that I look at is I always start with the, with the objective statement and that will, and depending on, on that, then I will go deeper or not. And usually what I'm looking for that there is somebody whose who's interests line up with mine. It, it's not, you know, it, you don't want to work with somebody who, who doesn't want to do what you're working on, right? So that, that's always the first, the first place to look. Um, so I look for that. And then I will look for, um, I, I like to see some idea of what the person's interested in working on. You don't have to come in and say, I'm going to write a thesis on X, because that wouldn't be realistic. But I do like to see that there's an interest in a particular, a particular you know, area or that you've given some you know, thought to what you want to 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 study to make sure that that does line up with the work that I do. Um, the next thing would then be the uh, uh, um, would then be letters of recommendation, and that just helps me see uh, what kind of work you've done, and that gets right back to, to what was just said about like internships and research experiences. Those are that's something that that I'm definitely looking at to see um, what how 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 you've worked as like an independent uh, you know worker, how you work in uh, the, a team environment. Um, you know, ha and then I might check, like, have you published anything? You don't have to have published anything, but if you have, that's something that I'll definitely look at and, and will like, you know, notice. So if you have an opportunity to do so, you should, but it's, it's not a requirement. Uh, and certainly like the GPA would be like the last thing if I even get that far, because it's, it's really, um, it's really the potential to succeed in research isn't necessary. I mean, yes, it's good to have a, you know, a good GPA and to show that you can do the coursework, but I think that, 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 uh, that those other items that definitely go higher on the list when I'm evaluating the application. And we're not looking at GREs anymore, at, uh, actually at all. And you know, I love that. So that's, uh, so that's great. Yeah, um, I, I don't think I have a lot more other things to add. Um, just emphasizing, you know, the previous experience in something else that are not classes, um, as Christine and Rebecca mentioned. Uh, my field is it's a little bit more niche. Um, so it's, it's actually really easy to know if someone is genuinely interested in, in this kind of like human performance within an aerospace department. Um, also, there are certain schools that, um, you know, I come from MIT and this is when I received all my, my um, sorry, my graduate education. So, you know, some people that have worked in this specific labs, uh, it's definitely people that catch my attention because I, I know they have been exposed to some of the things. Uh, and I'm trying to be as honest as, as I can uh, here. So if you had an internship at NASA, um, one of the groups that I work with, like, the, you know, the spacesuit group is like, oh, okay, this, this really interests me um, a lot. So that's, that's something that that obviously stands out for for me um, and then I also wanted to emphasize the extra um, activities extracurriculum activities uh, being part of team sports you know this has nothing to do with research right or at any association from your school of dance or, or something uh, you know, I have a student, she's like team captain of the gymnastics team. So that, that's fantastic. She's actually a, a great student um, also, but it's, it's, it's something that also catch my, my attention too. Because that shows leadership skills, that shows that you can work with people, uh, being, you know, follow some structure as part of a team, that's important too. To do, there's some rules that you're able to follow. 
and in the kind of research that I do, it's it's really important to you know be be serious with your experiments, make sure you control the variables, you can follow specific rules and things like that. So, so these type of skills, you know, has nothing to do with research, but that shows that you can you can function in, in the same kind of environment. I'll just add one brief thing. I also agree with everything everyone has said so far. Um, I just want to, one thing that I've not looked for, but like noticed in applications, which to me I kind of see as a positive thing, is for students that have worked before grad school, like an in industry in some capacity, and, and not a requirement, but I just kind of recognize like, oh, the student could be a little more mature. The student like knows what 40 hours a week of work is like, most likely, like, how, you know, and like what that feels like. And will really appreciate like the freedom and the like the kind of lifestyle the graduate the graduate school gives you and I, I say that because that was my personal experience so I like I feel like I empathize with that and my first graduate student that I took came from that path and one of my uh, one of my good friends in grad school also like that path and one thing just to point out about like both my graduate student and this other student who I was friends with um, they worked in careers that were not aerospace, but, and they may have had degrees that were not aerospace, but they, um, they went back and took a few aerospace classes before applying to grad school. So, I mean, I know there's probably a slow chance that anyone on this call maybe is in that path, but I just thought that was worth pointing out because, um, you know, you may be wondering, like, can I go to aerospace grad school without having done an aerospace degree? And like one, that's probably true no matter what, especially like we're always looking for people in related fields, like physics, I would definitely look for somebody with like a physics degree I'd be happy to see or in mathematics or things like that. Um, but even more broadly than that, I think you can come in to aerospace grad school from various backgrounds. And if, you if I can add to, if I can add to that, just, just a bit, I just wanted to say that um, because I do a lot of, of instrument like design and, and actually hardware, um, uh, um, 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 this building, I'm also, I'm often looking for like certain sets of skills. And this is where the luck of the timing comes in a little bit. But like, if I've got an instrument coming up and I need someone who can do electrical um, um, engineering, and I see that you've had some experience on that, that's going to put your, 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 your application is going to go like right up there. So it definitely, I mean, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't need to predict this, but I guess the point is, even if you have a skill that you think isn't particularly relevant, you should probably put it on there because it might be you just don't you just don't have that and have that insight. And and to also build on on the physics thing, I feel like it's my, it's become my um, like I love to find my physics students who want to go into engineering. It's like my favorite thing because I work in the astrophysics like instrumentation world. So having a student who understands the physics behind the instrument, huge. And so I get super excited when I see you know people like that. So don't. Don't don't like second guess if you have like relevant ex experience or like any experience, just put it down because some it, it it may happen to hit that button for somebody that you could you know end up having a great relationship with. So. All right, thanks everyone for uh, all your answers to that. Um, the next question is: Do you suggest that students um, reach out to specific labs or professors that they're interested in working with before they apply? And if so, how should they go about doing that? This one is so hard. <laughs> um, it's, I feel like it's just especially hard right now in the time uh, of like remote like work. I don't know about the rest of you, but my inbox has become unusable. Um, it's You're now connected that... to Boat Rockers 400. <laughs> um, it, it's just been like, like like very difficult to keep up with the, the volume because all of the hallway conversations that we used to have, everyone's an email now, right? So um, I know that this year I particularly haven't been you know, very responsive. I think um, it depends. Uh, how can I? I think it's worth giving it a shot to reach out. And I think if you could give a specific like, hey, I read like this uh, did a paper of yours and this part of it interested me. That kind of email is gonna pique my interest a little bit more than I like your lab, please email me back kind of thing, right? So if you can make a connection in the email, I think it's a little, at least for me, a little more likely that I'll be able, that I'll, it will reach, that I'll get to the top of my inbox list. 
Um, the other thing you can do though is a lot of schools, like I know, like for you know our department, you can reach out to to the to, uh, to the graduate um, um, the, the administrator who 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 that uh, that works with the graduate students coming in and once they're here, and then often she can connect you with students in the lab. So if you can't get me, you can often get you know one of the students who works with me, and that might be a nice way to sort of understand what the, what the lab is doing. So I'd also suggest going that route if you're having a hard time getting in touch with the, uh, you, uh, in touch with the faculty member. But yeah, you know, when you can do it, it does help because then they know your name, right? <laughs> yeah, so um, I would recommend emailing faculty and when you do email them, include your resume because we don't wanna have to like go log into the system and find out who you are and like what your qualifications are. Just when you send your email, hi, this is what I'm interested in studying. This is how it relates to what you do and your resume um, in that email. And you may or may not get a response back or, and it may come back like months later, like I'm getting emails now and I'm not looking at applications until January. And so in January, I might look at your application and be like, oh, like that's a good person. I wanna talk to that person and I'll email you then. Um, so again, a lot of this whole grad application process, don't take it personally. It doesn't mean that we're not interested. Um, it just might not be a good time at the end of the semester right now. Um, but I would definitely, I wouldn't send emails before you apply. I would only send the emails, you know, like after you apply because whether you apply or not, like we may not respond to you. And just because we re don't respond doesn't mean you shouldn't reply, apply. Um, so I would say apply, then send targeted emails to the people that you're interested in and then wait. <laughs> I guess that's the only advice I have there. Yeah, these, these are all great thoughts and I um, agree with everything. I would um, emphasize the fact that it's important to personalize the email. Uh, we get all these emails that sometimes people don't even like change the topic, like combustion and this, like, I don't do combustion. Like, what are you emailing me? This is not what I'm doing. So, and you can tell very quickly if these are for you or these are like copy paste for others. Like, we are really interested in, in that specific lab. You know, take the time to write that email and it can take a few days for you to catch up with the lab, look at the website, maybe write a couple of papers. Uh, and try to relate, I can try to find that specific element that is going to stand out and is going to make me stop at that email or, you know, whoever you're writing. Um, so, so I would really recommend that. Um, also, a lot of students now are asking, like, are you, I, I'm reaching out, you know, and, and they do everything great, everything that we are saying. And there is this question that I don't know how to answer, and it's always, are you planning to take any students? And it's just so like, I don't even know if I'm gonna be taking, taking students. And I, I know it's, it's probably what you wanna know. And if we say no, you're not gonna spend the time putting the application up there. But you know, going back to at least at TAMU, we can, we can get offers out there at any time. The funding can come at a different time with respect to the applications. So if you're interested in a lab, just put the application in there because probably you're putting the application somewhere else too. So it's not an extra, a lot of extra work to send it to a couple more places just in case. Um, so, so I would recommend that too. And, and also something that I wanted to say before. Um, so I'm now in my third year. Um, now I have, I don't know, like a lot of emails like these ones that we are talking right now. When I was in my first year, I, I really had to go out and find students. Like I had this funded project that I was in my first funding project, NASA project, four year NASA project. You don't see those anymore. Um, great opportunity for the student. You have your full PhD covers. Couldn't find students at all because people don't know you and, and you know, maybe, you don't have the reputation as other people, but you know, now we're getting popular and the second, third year, now it's like, I wish I had all these candidates before and, and now I can't take you because I don't have funding. 
So, so I guess I would it's just a, give it a chance to new professors. Uh, you have way more chances to be selected. Um, and, and, you know, it, it's, you know, it can work out really well. And we have tendency, let me, I'm going to say this, we have tendency to be a little bit more hands-on as opposed to these professors that have been around for 40 years. I, I had an advisor who was 80 years old. So obviously, you know, I couldn't talk about coding with my advisor. You know, there are certain things you, you can benefit from having a young faculty member. And I include everyone, in, in the, everyone from the panel in, in that group. So, so just, a, just a thought that also that requires maybe an extra effort to really go and find those websites. I'm assure you those websites are out there because this is the first thing we do. We wanna recruit students. So the first thing you're gonna do at the job is to put your website out there. So sending emails, sending Twitter, sending whatever. So the information is there and maybe, you know, we're not as known as other professors, but you know, the, the funding is, is there and we have startups and we can hire a bunch of students. So, so just some, something else to think about when you're looking for labs and, and place to go. Yeah, I, uh, the only thing I'll add, also agree with everything, but I will a second on this comment about the new professor like <laughs> um, situation. So last year was the first year I was recruiting students and I was, it was really hard. And the student that I did take in my lab, I definitely, I can't remember if he emailed, emailed me or like I, whatever happened, but I definitely had conversations like with students before I admitted them. And even this year, I see the difference of like this year, I'm actually getting more emails of students that are interested. And I think by next year, yeah, I probably won't be able to respond to all of them. So I would seek out the new professors. And then also like everyone said, don't be, um, don't be discouraged if they don't respond. Um, it doesn't mean that your application is not getting looked at. All right, thanks everyone for that. Um, the next question I wanna ask, um, just to make sure we get to it, we, like I've said a couple times, we have a lot of um, international students that are joining us for this panel. I think around a third of the audience is from outside the United States. So um, I wanted to ask if you have any specific suggestions or information for international students. Um, I know sometimes there's restrictions on the work that can be done. So is there, do you have any suggestions for international students applying on, on programs they should apply for or what they should include in their application if they're interested in graduate programs outside of their native country? I, I can add something very quickly. I, I don't think I, I personally think about this, a candidate is like, oh, you're international versus you're here. Like, I look at all the things we were talking about and, um, you know, I don't think there's anything specific from my point of view. What I would say is that, again, going back to that connection somehow with, with your students, if, if there are people coming from Spain or applying from Spain, um, I'm, I'm gonna be more curious, like, oh, which university? It's something that maybe I know more. So, so I don't know. I, I, I don't know if you suggest that go and look for professors from your same country. I, I don't think that's the right thing to say. Um, but but I think it's it's a true fact, at least that that happens to me. That that's something maybe to to I don't know to keep in mind maybe. I don't know, maybe you guys have a better advice. Yeah, I, this is another hard one for me because I do do a lot of hardware and there is a lot of restriction in terms of um, like, you know, like EAR and export control and who can see certain parts and not. And it's, it's a terrible part of the job. I'm going to be quite honest. Like I don't enjoy this and I don't enjoy that it's something that I have to deal with. And I would, I mean, MIT is an open like research university and the and the research like the fundamental like research part is is exempt but if we're building a CubeSat a lot of times the particular like electronics board I can I can only have like US citizens working on it which is which is a you know which is an issue 
and it's an industry issue I see. So, but, but that doesn't mean that there isn't other, there are plenty of areas within aerospace where you don't have this problem. It's just a particular issue if you're working on hardware. Um, so I, I don't have any advice for that. I just wanted to make people aware and I'm not trying to discourage you from the aerospace industry because I know that there are a lot of areas where you're doing like simulation like work and there's a, and there's plenty of stuff to do. It's just it's just a an issue that comes up for me depending on the projects that I have because there is so much you know hardware built that goes with it. Um, and so when I do have international students applying, and I, I have an international student in my group right now who, who is working on um, the CubeSat with me, and we need to get the, the correct licenses, and that's something that can be done as well. But just know that there might be extra steps to try to make in, to, to help to make that happen. Um, but I will also often look for look for projects that will fit look, you know look better, so it's not such a headache for everybody, and so that there's not this like obstacle in the work for them. Um, to keep things moving along, so. I have just a brief, or maybe two brief comments. Um, one is that all the programs I've been in are pretty international, and I think that is like really a strength of graduate school. I mean, it's just been a great experience to be a part of such an international community and learn from like colleagues from around the world. So I think, Emma, I, I mean, Becky could say, speak for MIT. I thought they were something like 40% international in their program. And Cornell, the class that was admitted last year was over 60% international students. So it, you'll definitely like be in, in good company, I think, a lot in a lot of programs. So that already shows that um, it's definitely possible. And um, one thing is like, one thing that I guess is kind of going against you as international is like the inability to apply for US fellowships but you may have fellowships back home that you like from your country uh, that you could apply for. So if you have applied for any of those or you're able to apply for those before you come, that could be something that would definitely give you a leg up just as having applied for those, those fellowships that your assistants are eligible for would potentially give you a, a leg up um, or be a nice thing to see on your application. It shows that you're like motivated to look for funding. But of course, again, you don't have to have it. It's definitely not like a requirement. Yeah, I am admitting my first international student or he's actually coming to the US in the spring. It's been delayed because of COVID. So I'm still learning how this, how this all works. Um, but I, I also, when I was in grad school, there were a lot of international students in my lab. And it, I mean, it's a, it's a great learning experience, right? But it, there are more hoops to jump through, so. Yeah, I, I can add a, a couple more things. So I was, and I still am an international person here, um, and I still don't have my green card for other reasons. Well, actually I, I, I came with a Fulbright fellowship, now that you mentioned the, the fellowship. So definitely I think that made a lot of difference to get accepted where I was accepted at, at MIT because I had my own funding. So that's definitely something that we haven't talked about the fellowships. If you, if you can come up with your own funding, that definitely opens you a lot of doors, especially if you are international. And, and the other comment that I would mention, and probably for, for everyone, not only for internationals, but something that helps me and, and definitely my husband at the time, he also was an international that went to grad school he took a trip and not everyone can do that, especially these days, but he took a trip through the US to visit personally all the universities. And one thing is to send an email to a professor, but another thing is like, hey, I'm gonna be in town for the next three days. Do you have 30 minutes that we can catch up? Um, even if you can see the professor, you will definitely be able to see the lab because they will put you in contact with the students and things. So, if, if you can afford to do that, um, both international and not national, but that's, you know, definitely you're gonna remember that name maybe a little bit more, even if you didn't have the opportunity to talk in person. But I think, I don't know, this happens very often. Um, and, and probably maybe Rebecca, or those of you who have been in the job more, more time can tell me better. 
but I, I think you typically accommodate those visits and talk to the students most of the time. I don't know. I'll let you talk about yeah. that. It certainly doesn't, it, it certainly isn't happening much this year, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, well, but okay. in the past, I mean, I'll say out of the, out of the five, the six, the six students that came to my group last year, um, the four of them had come to visit, had sort of appeared in the, you know, like in my hallway one day. And so I got to know them. And in fact, one of the students, the, uh, the student uh, that's actually international, he and I have been speaking since 2014, I think. He's applied to MIT four times. And I think this is an interesting story because it goes back to, to the timing thing. The first year, he, he, you know, he didn't get in. The second year, uh, the, uh, uh, the time he did get in, but then he had some, uh, some personal stuff that, that, uh, that, that stopped him from, uh, from coming. Then the third time, he got on the wait list and didn't get in. And the fourth time he was admitted. So that just goes to this whole idea that, that the timing is everything. You shouldn't take it personally. Clearly his qualifications are someone who can do this, who should be here, but it's just what was happening in the different like labs he was looking at. But the interesting thing was that he met with me like long before he first applied and he met with me every time. And we kind of kept this relationship going and now we're working um, and now we're finally working together, which is excellent. So certainly if someone says, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm going to be, you know, uh, you know, in your, um, uh, in your building. Do you have half an hour? I'm a little more likely to make the time for that than I am to answer the email. So I know that's not, you know, possible for everyone to do, and it's super hard to do right now. But when and if things, well, not if, I guess when things change back to some sort of, of normalcy, it, it is a good, uh, yeah, a good idea to do that if you can definitely second it. I used to have students like wait outside my door. So I'd come back from a meeting and they'd just be there. I'd be like, hi. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone for that. Um, so I know we're getting pretty close to an hour here. Um, and I know some people have to drop off, but if uh, our, any of our panelists are available to stay past an hour for another maybe uh, 15 or 20 minutes to answer some additional questions, that would be great. Um, but just with, you know, within our hour, I wanted to ask as a final question, um, what is one big myth of graduate school that you believed before you, you know, applied or went through the whole graduate school process yourself that you would like to dispel for our attendees tonight? I can go first because, well, I because I've go talked ahead. about this question with Matt before the panel as I'm ready. Um, my biggest fear, I guess, that I guess, I don't know, it was, is a myth that I generated for myself was that I maybe couldn't or would struggle to pass the qualifying exam. And I was just kind of terrified of that. And that uh, prevented me from applying to graduate school. Like, right when I heard there was an oral exam, I was like, oh, I'm out. <laughs> I'll do something else. And like, in retrospect, it was one of the best things I ever did was the exam and prepare for it. And uh, every and I guess the myth I thought was like people are trying to prevent you from succeeding, and it's quite the opposite. Everyone wants you to succeed, and every, you know we're filtering applications so that the people that come in do succeed. So you will succeed in your qualifying exam, and you'll work hard to get there, but you will succeed. So don't let that hold you back. I guess I guess my myth was that um, that everyone works nonstop. Right, that they don't do anything, grad students don't do anything other than work. Um, but that's not true, right? Like when I was in grad school, I was on an intramural inner tube water polo team where you sit on a inner tube in a pool and play water polo with a bunch of other grad students. Um, so I think it's important to have things that you do outside of school and, um, you know, you don't, you don't have to work a million hours a week. There's some weeks where you do end up working a million hours a week, but it doesn't have to be that way constantly. And especially once you're done with classes, it gets a little bit more manageable and you have more control over your time. Definitely, I found grad school to be more manageable than undergrad in terms of time management. Uh, all right, so for me, I guess it was um, 
you know, I was an international student, like the US and, and you know, universities and, and you know, these are all these things in the movies and, and you know, you have a, a, this picture of what the university is and uh, in particular in my case, I, I, as I said, I was lucky enough to to get into MIT, so, you know, like MIT, these crazy people and everyone is a genius and both professors and students that are there, like I'm, you know, I fell below everyone else and, and you know, this syndrome that everyone has, like, I'm just blanking on the name of the syndrome, but you feel that you're not worth it. Imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome, thank you. I mean, I think it's so nervous, like I don't remember the name. So this post, imposter syndrome, which I think it's, is very real um, and it happens to a lot of people in grad school. So, so you know, when, when I got there, you know, professors are, are people, um, as Elaine was saying, they just want you to succeed and, and they will do everything they can to help you. You know, these are not these crazy famous figures on, on, on TV, they, they are normal people working on, on real problems. Um, and there are the students around, you know, it's funny once I started, you know, having friends and, and my lab mates, everyone felt the same way with this imposter syndrome. And, and I think maybe these big name schools have, have this problem more than others, I don't know. But, but if you're admitted in, in a phase, like you're, as Elaine was saying, that there is a process, you have been through the process, and, and you're going to succeed and everything is in place for you to to succeed and, and make it so so just enjoy the ride and, and try to forget a little bit those fears I guess so I don't have anything that's all that different from what I, uh, I guess you all said I'll just say that I think once I mean for me like I, I didn't think much about it because I just kind of rolled from undergrad right into grad school in the same place and it wasn't much of a much of a process for me, but I, I think I, I did, so getting, I think that the, the, qual, uh, that for me, uh, that, that, um, the taking the quals was a big, a big concern for me. And I think I also, one thing that I learned, I would say is that you, is that you're not ended by the first time you have you, you know, a setback. So for example, I actually did not uh, I get past the quals the first time around and I got to go and take them again. I took them over in mechanical engineering and I was doing all of my research over in Arrow. It's a really long story some other time, but I, uh, I was told, sure, but you have to try again. And I had to, and I thought that, I mean, it was the first time literally in my life I had not passed a test like ever. <laughs> and it felt like such a high stakes one. And, but the reality was I, I took it again and yeah, I passed and it was great. And I have a doctorate and I'm doing exactly what I love you know, to do. So the idea that you can go to grad school and if, you know, you might have a setback, you might have something not go exactly the way that you, that you thought it was, but it, it's a ramp to another, another opportunity, or it's a learning experience. Like it's all good and you will succeed. You just have to have to get there on your own um, path. And I think that was something that I learned through the process was sort of learning that it's okay to sometimes not get it the first time. All right. Thanks everyone for all of that. I think that's a lot of, you know, very common things that a lot of people feel before they apply to grad school. And I hope that really helps dispel some of the myths and uh, realize that it's, you know, something that is a lot more attainable than, you know, a lot of people think that they may be able to attain as, as an undergrad applying to grad programs. So the, uh, the next question I wanted to ask, and I, I see we're at an hour here, so, so thank you for everyone. If, you know, if there's anyone that does have to drop off, the full recording of this will be up later, but I want to jump right into some of the other questions we've been receiving. Um, so one question is, do you have any advice for those students that are interested in aerospace, but have previous experience in another field? Maybe, you know, they did an undergrad or have worked in some field outside of aerospace. I guess I would just say kind of what I've seen work again um, is depends how far off it is. Like we said, physics something kind of STEM is like great. And I think a pretty easy transition. You may even find like, I'm starting a project that might be kind of like astrobiology related. So I, I might be looking for people with, uh, you know, bio backgrounds. Um, so I, you know, anything like that. And then if it's more far afield, like say you were working in 
data science. I, you know, even data science is there, but say something that's super far afield, then like, and you did your undergrad degree in something super non-technical, then I would recommend going back and taking a few classes and getting good grades in them to show that you're interested in aerospace and uh, that you can you can handle the course load. And I'm sure that you will. I've seen a few people do that and be very successful. But it doesn't have to be like a whole degree. Yeah, I definitely agree agree with everything. In my case, I'm always looking for people interested in you know this human performance, kinesiology. Um, these are very different people um, that maybe don't have necessarily any background in airspace. Uh, but these are very interested interesting people for me and students for me. So, so I'm definitely open to other fields, um, maybe really, really upfront. Uh, on the bad side, though, uh, my specific department here at Tamu has a very harsh slash traditional aerospace qualifying exam. Uh, so that could be a problem for them, for some of those students, not to do my research. To do my research, they are really well qualified, uh, but then you have to take a, an exam on dynamics and control, or uh, you know some structures or something like that. So that's also something that you wanna talk to the professor because remember when you're talking to a professor before getting into grad school, you're also interviewing the professor and making sure you are a good fit and, and you're gonna spend a lot of time working with us or with the professor. So we wanna choose the students that we wanna work with at, at, a, at a personal level as well, but you wanna, do that too um, and also in terms of calls and things like I did my, my calls at MIT and I think they are easier than the ones that we are doing or at least at the time because I only had to focus on human factors human performance like my own discipline but here at Tamu everyone does the same thing and you have to have a basic understanding of all the disciplines across the boards so these are things you also want to talk to the professor and how the department is working. We are trying to change that, just to put it up front and just make it a little bit you know, more fair to the students that do research in our field. But anyway, things to also think about and talk to the professor about, because if, if you don't have any background, getting to the calls as today at Tamu, it's, it's a little bit hard to do. Yeah, I'll just I'll just I'll just add that I think I feel like aerospace is a pretty like interdisciplinary type of field because it's like a lot of I mean I know that the that the instruments I built and the CubeSats, man, people that have a background in either you know double E or software, <laughs> sign them up like that's what we need <laughs> like a lot. So the you know it, yes, and there there are differences about like writing software that's going to go on a spacecraft between you know and writing a you know a, you know and writing an app on your phone or whatever because there's stuff about how a spacecraft operates. But you can but you can learn that right and and the skills that you have in uh, you know software is going to be really uh, um. Um, you know, valuable. So I think there's a lot of, of like interdisciplinary opportunities. Uh, I did want to note for uh, I, um, the, I think it's a good point about, um, you know, studying uh, for the qualifiers. Like at MIT, we no longer have an exam. So we've actually, uh, well, at least like in the aerospace department, all the departments are different. I took mine over in Mechie, so I never took the aerospace ones actually, but um, we are now students have to get like an A in two uh, particular, um, the, 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 well, there's a list of, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, each like sector has a list of courses and you have to have to get A's in two of them and, you know, at least to be in, um, I guess, in, the, the, uh, in this other one. And you can pick from the list. If you don't do that, then you can actually take an oral exam. So that's changed a little bit. And I think it will make it more accessible to interdisciplinary um, 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 people because you can you can learn as the class is going and like just do well in the, um, you know, in the course and not have this sort of high stakes exam that determines, you know, your fate. Um, so that that might make things a little bit a little bit smoother there. I definitely take students um, from outside of aerospace engineering. So I've had students with physics backgrounds, astronomy, 
math, computer science. Um, so that's definitely a benefit in, in my field because we're very interdisciplinary. Um, you know, it, it can be a little bit tough, some of the classes, but you know, usually these are fields that are related to aerospace. And because of our, our qualifying exam, um, you know, you choose which, which faculty are going to be on your thesis committee. And those are the, the members that, that run your qualifying exam. So you're, you're questioned on things that are relevant to your thesis topic. So the, the qualifying exam, um, the idea is that, you know, it is actually helpful for you actually to get your PhD, you know, the, the qualifying exam is, it's, you know, in some places more of a hazing ritual than in others, but it's really the experience of going through the qualifying exam and like doing the studying that you need to do to pass it. That's the valuable part of the qualifying exam, not so much the exam itself. Um, so it's a painful experience to go through, but, but afterwards, like I reflecting back on my own studying for the quals, like that studying period, that was a really valuable time to cement all that fundamental knowledge that you gain in classes. And you just, you don't really like link it all together until you just take a couple months and, and think about it and review it on your own. Um, so, so yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think, so I think that what you're describing as the qualifying exam, at least at Maryland is the comprehensive exam, but that definitely, I think that was like the pinnacle of, you know, where I knew the most that I knew about all my coursework was right after my comprehensive exam. Yeah, my professor said that's the smartest that you have are gonna ever be um, with all the knowledge in there. Um, and that actually for now, it, I think it's actually true. But we'll see if I get smarter. <laughs> I don't think I'm as smart or, you know, have that information as. It's a different kind of, of smart now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I totally agree. I do miss that aspect of it. Yeah, yeah so, so make sure you ask what those are, um, because I, I think that's important to know what can you do before to get ready. Um, I think the main advice is, is like you, you can get ready for it, you can prepare for it, but different places require different things. Uh, apparently, you know, at MIT, there is no exam anymore. It's more about coursework and other places. It's, it's more about your thesis. At TAMU today, things are evolving because I think we are sort of catching up with everyone else, uh, moving more from a very traditional exam towards a more focused, you know, focusing your area because of the multidisciplinary aspects of, of it. And, and we are changing the, the way we have conversations every month about this. But as today, it's what it is. And, and you, at least at Tamil, they require more traditional disciplines and everyone has to go through it and make a fluid and things, even if you're not gonna use it for, for your research. So things to talk about. All right, thanks for all your responses on that. One um, kind of related question that we have is, uh, do you look at applications differently um, if for students that are applying straight out of uh, getting their bachelor's degree as opposed to if they're applying from a master's program um, and you know potentially a master's program in a different field as well, um, but also just in general, or is, is there you know different strategies people should employ if they're applying straight from a bachelor's degree or if they're applying having already attained a master's degree? I think that either way you just want to focus on the relevant like research experience that you have. If you if, if you did any undergraduate uh, you know research, if you had in that they're called your ops at MIT like an undergraduate research opportunity, um, if you worked with you know like a graduate student as an undergrad that would be important to talk about if you've had a chance to publish. But I, I don't really see a big difference it's, it's just all about what experiences you've had up to that uh you know point like where you got them not super relevant to me at least i think yeah i mean it doesn't matter to me whether someone's coming in with just a bachelor's or a master's um you know i 
I look at the, the things that I look for are pretty much the same. Yeah, same, same thing, Not, nothing else to add here. Um, same. I think that covered all of the uh, all the major topics that we received questions on. So um, I guess if anyone has any other questions, any last minute questions I want to enter in the chat, um, by all means. And uh, well, we're giving people a chance to do that if any of you guys have any last closing thoughts or anything. I guess I have one piece of advice for, for students that apply. Um, is definitely if you have an interview with a faculty member, make sure you have a list of questions to ask them um, because you should have a lot of questions. Um, the faculty members, like they have a lot of power over your life for the next four years. Um, so you, there should be a lot of things that you wanna know about, about how they run their lab and what their qualifying exams are like and, what type of research they do and how does funding work and there's a lot of questions that you should want to know about so to me if a student is not asking questions that says to me that they don't really understand how grad school works um, and it's going to you know that is a kind of a red flag for me so definitely view the interview as not just you being interviewed but you're also interviewing your faculty advisor and the school to see if it's the place you want to go Um, I, I guess another thing I could say, it's just be yourself when you're, not only when you're doing the interview, but maybe also when you're writing, when you're writing your essay. And I, I know this is not as easy, um, you know, but don't try to sell yourself as something you, you are not, like you don't want to be, end up in a place where you're, not it's not a good place for you it's not, it doesn't match your research interest at grad school it's it's fun but you know it also requires a lot of work and and you know a lot of like stressful experiences sometimes and it, it's something you want to be passionate about and, and you really want to do um apply a couple of times also if needed like in, in my case I, I see a question about the GRE I did the GRE twice i did the TOEFL like four times to get the, the right thing uh just just keep pushing whatever you want to do and um and, and i guess to the example that rebecca was saying someone who applied two or three or four times to mit um if there is a lab or there is a, a research area that you you really feel passionate about just just go for it and, that, and that's going to show when you write your your you're sorry i'm i've been away for too long today i, I had a lot of minutes when you write your essay sorry about that just just really try to to talk about yourself or, or really be be true to to your your beliefs and your passion and i think that's going to show and that's the best uh, way you can write your your essay too and say for the interview I guess just one last thing I'll say is that, you know, you deserve to be there and don't forget that, you know, you're, you deserve to be there and you're smart enough to be there and you're going to do great. I'm just going to second all of that because you guys took all the good advice, but that's all super, super good advice. So just listen to them. <laughs> Now I want to apply to grad school again. <laughs> <laughs> there is this, uh, I guess, question here about if it if it helps to to, uh, to submit scores even if the school um, 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 even if they are actually waived. And I, I, I just I can only talk about it from my experience. But we're like we're like we're actively not looking at them any you know longer. So it, they're just not being considered. So there's no there's no reason to submit them. Like no one's gonna look at them. At, you know that at MIT that might be different elsewhere, or in the aerospace department as well. It's different in different departments. Well, 
That sounds great. I think that that pretty much touches on all the topics that we had. So I want to thank our panel again for being here for this event. And thank you all again for attending.